<laughs> okay. So, um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and what does Editor and Publisher do? Okay. Um, well, I'm Greg Mitchell. I'm the editor of Editor and Publisher. Editor and Publisher is the bible of the newspaper industry. It's been around since 1884, and uh, it continues to be the leading publication uh, of the uh, industry right now. It has a very active website and uh, a monthly print edition. So who is your uh, viewership then? Uh, it's people within... Okay, hold on a second. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, let me just uh, preface when I... When I ask questions, I'm going to try to attempt to uh, edit my voice out. Right. So if you could start in uh, full sentences right. to okay. incorporate the questions. Okay. Uh, our audience is made up mainly of people within the newspaper industry, uh, top editors, top publishers, reporters, uh, business people, circulation, advertising, and so forth. Also includes many people in universities, both the faculty and students. Uh, media critics, uh, online uh, bloggers, uh, people at uh, newspaper and other media websites, uh, anyone who has anything to do with uh, the newspaper business or is interested in, in press coverage. Okay, and so could you give me kind of an overview of uh, kind of the food chain of uh, like who can make the decision that decides what's news and how that flows down? What's, you mean, what's, uh, what's like, really... For example, like the New York Times, if they show something <clears throat> on the front page, it may become, you know, more news all around. Versus, right. You know... You mean who makes the decision in the industry or well, at, at it, editor and publisher? <laughs> no, within, uh, within the industry. Um, right. Who are the most powerful editors and, and why? You mean it, 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 around the country or... Right, who around are... the, in the United States. Gee. Um... I'm not quite sure how to answer that because there, I mean, there's there's many top uh, newspapers around the country. Uh, well, I, I'll try to answer it, but it's really hard to. Uh, well, there are many leading newspapers around the country. Uh, probably the ones that are thought of as the most influential are the New York Times, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times. Uh, then it drops down a bit to the, the Boston Globe and uh, San Francisco Chronicle and Dallas Morning News, Miami Herald. Uh, so the editors of these publications have a great deal of power and a great deal of influence in, in how they play stories. But nowadays, uh, unlike the old days, uh, there's many other forces at work. Of course, there's television and cable TV and, and radio, but also now there's the Internet. Uh, both uh, Internet news sites such as CNN, MSNBC, USA Today, uh, but also individual media sites. Uh, so sometimes a story will will be in a place like the New York Times or the Associated Press, maybe not get that that much attention, but then it starts to get picked up at internet sites and places like Editor and Publisher, and then it takes on a life of its own. It gets picked up in many other websites and then many other newspapers, and uh, we've had many cases where we've done stories that uh, have ended up on television that night, uh, strictly from the bottom up, so it's sort of like grassroots news coverage that then works its way up the food chain and uh, ends up getting uh, getting national attention. Okay, so in a way, a lot of the uh, technology is kind of democratizing the, that, you know, breaking down a lot of the walls that were up there previously. You know. Right, I mean, so, okay. Uh, some people uh, run blogs, which, you know, are personal websites, and, and even people like that sometimes uh, cover stories that end up then getting national attention. So uh, it's really quite a different system now than it, than it used to be. Uh, in fact, uh, the editor and publisher, which has been around uh, 120 years, you know, I, I can honestly say has had more impact with its stories in the past uh, year than it did in all those previous years. Uh, and the reason is that our website became phenomenally popular. Uh, it has a lot of respect. And so we get links on many other websites and picked mentioned in USA Today and you know television. And um, so it's made what we write and what we do much more influential than it ever was. So it's, uh, it gives us a certain amount of power uh, that we never had before. And with respect to the uh, um, lead up to the war in Iraq coverage, how has that in a publisher influenced that kind of debate or the uh, what stories have yeah. Well, we we noticed in the uh, in the months uh, leading up to the what became the invasion of Iraq that uh, most newspapers were kind of going along quietly with the uh, 
the Bush administration claims. And um, we were quite alarmed with that, and we speak to the entire newspaper industry. So um, you know, we thought we had a real role in continually calling attention to the questions that the press was not asking. In fact, we ran a cover story in January of 2003, more than two months before the invasion. And the cover story was called Unanswered Questions, and it had a picture of Bush. And uh, so we recognized early on that uh, a lot of the assumptions and declarations of, of evidence from the administration were very weak and that the press was not uh, pressing them uh, hard enough. And unfortunately, uh, we had to keep that up uh, during the war, after the war. And uh, unfortunately, we've been proven correct on virtually everything that we were warning about because the weapons of mass destruction were not found. The links to between Iraq and al-Qaeda uh, were not discovered. Um, the fact that the war was going to be incredibly more costly, uh, there were going to be more casualties, it was going to go on longer than anyone imagined. All these things that we were raising um, at the beginning of 2003 have all come to pass. So it, despite our warnings, I mean, in some ways, it made us feel good because we got a lot of attention, a lot of credit for, for doing that. We won a major award for our, our news coverage throughout the year. Um, but on the other hand, it made us feel also a little helpless because we weren't uh, able to swing the newspaper industry as a whole uh, behind uh, some of the alarms we were raising. Um, and uh, unfortunately, many of them ended up with egg on their face. Uh, and um, But nevertheless, we felt we did a real service and Eventually, we've brought a lot of a lot of places around to uh, to admitting the failures and uh, hopefully uh, doing a more of a watchdog approach in the future. So, leading up to the war in Iraq, you would say that th you noticed that the media could have been doing more. What do you think they could have been doing more of? Well, the uh, well, let me start over. Uh, there was uh, uh, an assumption, perhaps it's a patriotic uh, duty that most uh, most of the press and media fall into, that uh, they should not question too skeptically or cynically uh, the claims coming from Washington. Uh, I think it's, it's natural on the one hand, but I think the tone of all our coverage on Iraq, in fact, all our coverage on all subjects, is not to be partisan or not to be uh, you know, left or right or anything like that, but we believe in the what, what should be the main principle of journalism besides being accurate and fair is to be skeptical, you know, to raise questions, to not take what officials say as the gospel truth unless it's really proven, if there's documents. Um, and that, it, 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 in this case, it happens to be Washington, it happens to be a, a White House or Congress, um, but it can be in, in a, a small town. You're covering the mayor's office, you're covering a an agency in a small town, um, you're covering any kind of uh, official uh, claims in a, in a small town. The journalistic principle is the same. You know, to be skeptical unless there's hard evidence and proof and you report what someone says, it's their claim, it's what they say, it's what they allege, it's, it's uh, what they're uh, trying to prove. But you don't present these things as fact if you're not sure they're fact. And what happened with the Iraq coverage was that uh, too often uh, newspapers and, and especially television uh, went with stories that were based on official claims. Uh, and in retrospect, were really propaganda because in some cases the officials uh, were well-meaning. They, they, maybe they thought they had the evidence, but in other cases they, uh, uh, they knew their evidence was incredibly shaky or should have known and yet went with the evidence. Uh, claiming it was fact, and the press just, uh, in most cases, accepted it. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think at what point. So we end up. What's that? I'm just checking. Okay. The um, so just got the the phone thing. Yeah. I just want to make sure I got a, a clean sound <clears throat> on that. So, uh, pick up from uh, the. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm trying to think of. Uh, well, let me just let me just ask uh, this: What do you what do you attribute the um, these lack of asking questions? Why didn't why weren't these questions being asked? What what factors were playing into that? Okay. 
Well, there are various factors in why the, the press did not ask tough questions uh, often enough. Uh, and of course, one was just patriotism. You know, as Dan Rather said, uh, when we're at war, I'm, uh, I'm biased in favor of my own country. Uh, and, and that's understandable. I mean, I, you can't get away from that uh, completely. Uh, but uh, people took too much of a rah-rah attitude. Um, the second was just not being skeptical enough. You know, we, we, in journalism school, they teach uh, reporters at the lowest level to be uh, skeptical of what officials say uh, and make them, make them prove their assertions or print their claims as claims. Uh, when Colin Powell went before the United Nations uh, and laid out his evidence for the war, uh, virtually all the newspapers the next day reported what he said with a reverential tone, saying, saying that he had made his case, uh, called it you know, convincing, overwhelming evidence, and so forth. When what they should have done was said he made a partisan case, he laid out evidence totally unproven, made assertions, uh, showed uh, photographs that had uh, not been verified by anyone, um, and, um, and also published uh, the quotes from some people questioning it. Um, but instead, they rolled over, and uh, it was that was one of the one of, if not the, key moments in the run-up to the war. Now, little editor and publisher, the next day and the, the days ahead, uh, beyond that, uh, published uh, stories on our website, uh, raising those very questions. It didn't take uh, you know uh, hindsight. It didn't take a huge staff. Uh, it just took a, a few journalists who were acting on the principles of journalism to be skeptical. And if we, if little editor and publisher could point out the, uh, that the case had not really been made or needed to be proven, um, you know, it made us wonder why some of the bigger outlets just sort of rolled over. Do you think that, um, you know, from looking at television, it seemed like they were not being skeptical at all after November 8th, after the war resolution, mm. which is kind of assume that we had authorization to go to war. Did, did you do any reporting on international law issues and can no. comment on issues that, um, you know, there's a big debate of whether or not, you know, the administration was saying that they had authorization, but everyone else in the world was saying that they didn't. So. Well, I mean, it was just authorization. It was just a con congressional thing. I don't know. It just didn't. Uh, I would say this of it. Uh, uh, as weak as newspapers were, uh, television was far worse. Uh, in fact, we ran articles where we, uh, perhaps because we, we served the newspaper industry, you know, we would say uh, uh, television is really getting it wrong. Television is really over the top with the raw raw coverage, but newspapers have a lot to explain too, and that's that's how I would uh, I would see it. I think the press, uh, partly because the press is, uh, can present more. Um, uh, questioning uh, articles in different sections of the paper, editorials, op-ed pieces, and so forth, uh, and can can show more balance where newspapers were more stark. And then there was the whole question of embedded reporters. We raised questions about the embedded um, reporter um, scenario way before the war. You know, we were saying almost from the get-go that this had a lot of advantages, but it had a lot of disadvantages too. It, it didn't take hindsight to say that putting 500 reporters in living with the troops was going to cause a conflict of interest and that you would tend to get coverage that would glorify what the reporters were doing. And it's exactly what happened. You got some great journalism, you had some great uh, uh, reporters who did, you know, stand back a bit and, and uh, print to all sides. But you had so many, especially on television, who were, uh, were cheerleaders. And um, it was no surprise to us. And again, I'm not sure why it was a surprise to uh, other people later. Right, right. Well, the, the, the film that I'm working on, I'm looking at the, the time period leading up to the war. Mm -hmm. And um, one question I have is, how, how do you see that newspapers influence the television news coverage at night? Um, well, I guess I could say this. Yeah. Um, normally, in day-to-day in -day, uh, coverage, uh, television often picks up what's been in the newspapers that morning uh, and, and runs with it. They get most of their ideas from newspapers, and, and this is even more true on local levels uh, with local TV stations and newspapers. Um, they just take what, <laughs> what they can get from the morning paper and uh, get some visuals, and that's often what the coverage is. Uh, that's often true on the national level as well, but in the case of the war, uh, 
where there was continually breaking news and a need for visuals and uh, continual uh, accent on, on the anchor uh, talking about the war with tremendous visuals and American flags and, and so forth in the background, uh, the crawls running along the bottom of the screens, um, and the uh, reports from the embedded reporters on the scene. Um, in a way, it was a reversal. Newspapers really couldn't quite keep up with that. Uh, to some extent on their websites, they did. But uh, you know, television, because of the visuals from the embedded reporters and so forth, um, really was running on its own. And I think to some extent, it shows you uh, what the dangers are of an unfettered uh, television uh, coverage that's not grounded in the print, more of the principles of print, where again, you tend to stand back a little bit. You tend to get all sides, you tend to bring in some opposing views, and you have uh, op-ed pieces that you know, can balance what's, what's uh, on the front pages. So, uh, but the TV coverage was just, you know, rah-rah, you know, 24-7. And um, so I think that was a real problem. I think they, they could have used more of a newspaper approach. Okay. And um, how do you see the, kind of the role of public relations with um, you know, government crafting their message very right. specifically and, um, and, and how yeah, just uh, speak on it, to yeah. the role of public relations in, in versus journalism. Right. Well, in this war, uh, you had uh, uh, many uh, press briefings by officials uh, in the, from Rumsfeld and uh, other cabinet members and military officers that were off the record that reporters could only attend them if they agreed not to quote anyone directly. So the reporters were getting a lot of information uh, that they couldn't attribute and that was being given to them as insiders. And the tendency is always uh, you're in the room with a, with a Rumsfeld and he's giving you exclusive information. It sounds like it's, uh, you know, gee, what more could you want? Exclusive inside information during a war. And I think people too often treated it with great reverence, uh, just being in the room and, and being having access to that. Um, there's, in fact, a movement uh, uh, now by reporters, uh, bureau chiefs and so forth in Washington who for the first time are banding together and beginning to demand that uh, they will not attend press briefings anymore if those kind of rules are in effect, that they may boycott press briefings with those kind of rules. So, so that's one uh, factor in the coverage. Another factor is the presidential press conferences. Uh, you know, Bush has had very, very few of them. And um, there was a famous one on the eve of the war where he uh, uh, had a press conference um, and uh, reporters were there and he uh, only took a few questions and the questions were, the people who were going to ask the questions were all picked in advance and the reporters act, asked very weak questions, uh, especially considering they're on the eve of war. If, if, if this was, and it was his first pr press conference in months. Um, if it had not even been a wartime, uh, you might have felt the questions were kind of weak. But on the eve of war, um, it was an amazingly weak performance by the press. And you know, again, editor and publisher the next day, did uh, we did a column called, I think it was something like 14 questions the press didn't ask. Um, and it got tremendous pickup. And it got, and it got, we ran, we ran a, the day after that press conference, okay. The day after the press con conference, uh, editor and publisher ran a, a column uh, called 14 Questions the Press Didn't Ask Bush. And uh, it, it was uh, so shocking to people or so strong or so, it, it was on the mind of so many observers that these questions had not been asked that that column got tremendous picked up. It was picked up by all over the country and mentioned in, in uh, major media and websites and, and, and everything. Not because there was anything brilliant about it, it just that the, this was what people, millions of people had, had watched that performance and were appalled. And so it struck a nerve. Uh, so again, it's not a matter of hindsight that, you know, a year later, people suddenly dawned on people, well, geez, maybe tougher questions should have been asked. It was obvious to many people right away. And uh, so uh, I think there's a real, real lessons there um, that, uh, that I hope journalists will learn for the future. I mean, all of this is, is for the... Uh, you know, for the, the, the uh, hopefully the assistance of future uh, 
uh, years and future administrations and future generations of journalists that they might learn something from this. But I have to say that uh, in the months after, after the war started, we saw much of the same behavior and uh, things got tougher after a while. I think you got more probing uh, much later, but uh, even, to this, uh, even to this date, uh, there's still not enough questioning by, by reporters of official claims. Uh, look behind the, uh, the claims for the real evidence. And can you talk a little bit about um, some of the reporting that you've done on Knight Ritter and some of the information that they were able to dig up from um, right. unnamed sources? We found that uh, there were uh, some of the toughest critics, uh, at least among reporters, who actually dug deep behind the evidence uh, after the war was over to look at the, the rationales for the war, to look at who was feeding the administration information, to look at where all this false information about weapons of mass destruction came from, that uh, some of the best reporting, or in some cases some of the only reporting, came from places like Knight Ritter, it came from UPI, it came from the Associated Press. Um, some people who are not usually associated with that kind of groundbreaking uh, journalism or, or real scoops or investigative journalism that, that could win awards. Um, and uh, so it, it made us think to some extent that some of these places were a little bit outside of the beltway or a little bit outside of the this group think that uh, goes into, to some extent, or at least in the coverage of the war, went into uh, helping to shackle the New York Times and maybe some of the networks uh, that these people are major players who were a little afraid of getting ahead of the story. So they went along with the conventional wisdom, where some of the smaller players were not trapped into that. And uh, we've run many stories sort of tipping our hat to, to some of these places, which uh, ahead of the New York Times, for example, and CBS uh, was digging out some of this evidence. So there, there really were, there really were uh, some really terrific um, um, efforts made uh, that didn't make the radar screen in, in some places, but which you know, we covered uh, extensively. And can you talk a little bit about the, the PAC mentality of the press uh, leading up to the war? Uh, and is that always, uh, uh, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of that? Well, I guess I just talked about it a little bit. Um, I think, oh, okay, well, what, what happens to, to some extent is, uh, is that uh, editors uh, don't want to get too far ahead of, of what's already out there. Uh, and one thing they always have to remember is uh, while reporters get a lot of criticism for their individual stories, that uh, it's really the editors who may assign the stories, who certainly okay the stories, certainly edit them. And uh, just as important, decide where they're going to be played in the paper. I mean, you can bury a story if you're a little uncertain about it. Uh, you can kill it entirely. You can put it on page one. You can put it on the top of page one. You could uh, run the same story or variations for four or five days, or you can just let it go away. And so one of the, the real uh, problems was, uh, in, particularly in, in the coverage of the, the war, was places like the New York Times which not only ran countless numbers of stories that have been proven, you know, at least partly false, but they also played them at the top of the front page, or at least on the front page, signaling that these were stories that were very strong, very factual, very important. Um, if they had buried them, they wouldn't, it wouldn't have had half the impact. And so as the pre-war developed, uh, we found many cases where the administration, which is usually critical of the New York Times, was taking stories that were in the New York Times and citing them as evidence. So we had what we've, we've called in some columns the echo chamber uh, between the, the press and the administration uh, where stories get passed, passed back and forth in a way and the more they're repeated, uh, the more solid they seem. And so you get this kind of myth of, uh, of evidence that's built up and credibility where all, actually, you know, as it turns out, a lot of these stories were based on uh, only on evidence supplied by defectors, by uh, Mr. Chalabi, by uh, people who were, who were completely partisan in trying to create the war. And so they leak something somewhere, it ends up in the administration, it gets passed to the press, the press publishes it, then it gets cited by the administration. <laughs> so it's, that's why we call it an echo chamber. And all of it might just be the evidence of one person 
who has a stake in the outcome uh, of a war passing bogus information. So um, I, I just think the whole, um, this whole episode of the build-up to the war um, you know, is going to turn out to be one of the most appalling periods in the history of the press. Uh, which is not to say there wasn't a lot of tremendous coverage and a lot of tremendous work by various reporters and, and so forth, but I think when they look at the, the end result, which was a, is a very costly war, uh, it's going to have to rank as one of the, one of the worst uh, press performances, uh, you know, of in recent time. Okay, great. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we're working on the project. Um, let me ask you about, let's see, uh, <coughs> to my notes. Um, well, the issue of, you talked a little bit about the importance of editors and um, a lot of conservative organizations like the Media Research Center will be claiming a liberal media bias. Right. And I know that you're starting to do some investigation. Right. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what, how do you see liberal media bias claims in general, but also how did that play up in the lead up to the war in Iraq? Well, I could just okay, I could just say no. Well, um, well one factor in the coverage, uh, although it can't really be proven, is, is how much the hammering at the media for, for years now about the alleged liberal bias um, had to do with uh, the, the media, particularly television, bending over backwards to support the administration, to support the, the patriotic cause, uh, where ordinarily they might have been more skeptical. But it's almost a feeling like we get hammered, we get hammered, we get hammered. Now here's a chance to really show how patriotic we are, how we stand up for America as much as anyone else, uh, how we'll, st we'll stand up for the Republican president um, even if we have some doubts. Uh, now, it's unproven. But I uh, would say that uh, intuitively, at least part of that has to be correct, uh, that there's a bending over backwards to prove uh, your objective or to prove you're, you're, uh, you're not liberal or you're not questioning and, and so forth. Um, but you know, having said that, um, the Democrats in general um, didn't question the war you know, by and large. Um, so the media, Again, there was kind of an echo chamber built up here where there was very little questioning that was going on. And so the war you know, came about rather easily. So, uh, so I think that's where liberal bias or alleged liberal bias can play into it, but actually in a negative way. You know, normally you'd say uh, you know, liberal bias causes uh, you know, too much criticism of uh, Republican actions, but uh, it can also uh, cause the same people. There's nothing I can do about that. It's, it's actually the computer telling me I'm getting mail. Oh, yeah. So, but, um, um, <clears throat> you probably got enough from that. Yeah, I, was sort, well, sort of, I was sort of repeating like, myself. And, what I want to, um, <clears throat> I guess a lot of, from what I see, is that the liberal media, bot, the liberal, the claims of liberal bias will apply more to uh, domestic issues and not so much as foreign policy no. issues. And, and what do you see that? The survey, I mean, I, I do take seriously surveys that show that uh, uh, there are more liberals in newsrooms than conservatives. I think that's probably true. There's a lot, of, a lot of reasons for that, which has to do with the nature of the business itself and the type of people who are likely go into grubby newspaper work uh, might tend to be uh, more on the liberal side. Um, but in terms of international coverage, um, you can go back to Vietnam and Every foreign adventure that America has been involved with since then, uh, many interventions abroad, uh, the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War, and um, uh, practically everything, the press has unified behind the presidential action. Uh, so the, if you want to characterize, the press has, has certainly been, been, uh, been at, uh, at the most moderate on, uh, on international coverage, no matter what you might say about them in terms of of some of their domestic coverage. So, um, you know, the war plays into that uh, as well. Uh, the press is, you know, wants to show that it's, uh, you know, it can be tough. It's almost like a politician. You know, the press wants to show it can be, can be tough. And that's partly what went into the, 
the glorification of the embedded reporters, because you know here was their people risking their lives uh, on the front lines, um, and you got tremendous visuals. So it was just, it was a, it was a great package. Um, but I think you know in in, in general, a statement I would make is that the coverage of the war itself on the ground, you know, except for the fact that they underplayed the uh, civilian casualties. Um, I don't think that was the real problem. The problem was getting into the war. You know, once we were in the war, it was going to be played out the way it went. You know, uh, there was going to be a lot of death. Uh, it wasn't going to take that long to win because of the, the state of the opposition. Uh, and then, as we predicted, it was going to be a long, deadly occupation. It was going to be worse than any people were saying, and so forth. But the embedded reporters, uh, while I have a lot of questions about the work they did, they're not the real problem. The problem was the getting us into the war. It was the many reports in the New York Times and other places that led to the war. And those are the people that really have to answer the, the tough questions. Uh, because, uh, you know, that's, given what has happened with the war, given what has happened with the war, um, it was the pre-war coverage that really is, uh, it really is the most significant in all this. Okay, great. Um, um, can you kind of, um, have you done evaluations with like say the New York Times, Washington Post to say that leading up to the war they were mostly pro-war or anti-war? <coughs> there are a lot of claims uh, from both sides, the liberals will say that they were pro-war and the conservatives will say they were anti-war. So can you say well, from your viewpoint? Well, I don't know if any conservatives are saying that it was anti-war. Uh, well, Andrew Sullivan's yeah. one. Many that their coverage was anti-war, be leading up to the war. Yeah, there's a number of conservatives say that these newspapers are liberal and that they're that the New York Times is anti-war, Washington Post anti. -war. You mean in general? Right. You mean in, not, right. but not With in the Iraq, case of right. this. Right. In the case of Iraq. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe since, you know, maybe since the you know, recent months or okay, something. Sorry, but just, I don't know. Just start from the <laughs> From, uh, I don't know what to say. I don't. I don't know how to answer that question. It's. Uh, I don't really see that. I don't see. I don't see people really saying that at the, at, at the time. You know. Uh, uh, we. Uh, well, I could say this. Well, one of the odd things was that uh, during that run up to the war, uh, the weeks before the invasion, uh, EMP was the only publication that was doing weekly updates surveys of uh, editorial opinion, not news coverage, but what was being said in newspaper editorials, not their op-ed columnists, syndicated columnists, or anything like that, what the newspapers themselves were saying. And what was very odd was that uh, it was kind of a reversal of what often happens. Often you'll find uh, editorial pages very rah-rah for uh, intervention and wars and so forth, uh, and news coverage more skeptical. Uh, so people will single out reporters or they'll say such and such a newspaper is you know, liberal or anti-war or something like that. What was odd in this was that our survey showed uh, of the t top 50 or top 100 newspapers was that uh, the newspapers on the editorial page were very divided on the war or were raising questions. It's about the first time I can ever remember where the editors or the editorial page editors were raising more questions about a war or about the evidence that was presented, then uh, we were seen on the front pages. Uh, so it seemed like the, the editors, the news editors, and the reporters were going along with the buildup and were, were not questioning what Rumsfeld said and what Powell said and what Bush said. Um, but the editors from their easy chairs uh, were. Um, and that was sort of a reversal. So we, in other words, we were finding that uh, even newspapers like the Washington Post, which uh, has had some of the better coverage and some of the tougher coverage, you know, after the war. Really, a lot of tremendous reporters there, you know, completely out, out Fox, the New York Times. Um, they were and remained, uh, even as I speak, very pro-war. Uh, their editorial page has been very supportive of the war from the get-go, even while on their news pages, you know, they've been more questioning. The New York Times on their news pages really helped build up the war, really helped make the war possible. Uh, their editorial page raised some questions. It certainly was not anti-war, but it did raise some questions. So it was an interesting uh, dichotomy in this case. 
there, uh, but uh, where, where some newspapers, even some conservative newspapers, were raising some questions about the war on their editorial page, even while their news pages were sort of helping to make it possible. And have you looked at um, television news uh, like ABC, CBS, and, and uh, NBC specifically? Um, the quality of the investigative or enterprise reporting that, that happens on the broadcast television news stations? I, know, I really can't, you know, I don't see enough of it to really comment. I mean, I watched a lot of the war, you know, the war coverage as it was going on, you know, that nightly kind of thing, but in terms of, you know, what they've done or who's better than the others or anything, I, I really don't know. Okay, and because um, uh, one question I have is, you know, in, in newspapers you have editorial writers to kind of analyze and give a lot of context, but with television you don't have that. Um, can you speak to what effects that has with kind of having this race wars <coughs> coverage, kind of covering issues on, on, covering issues or stories as issues as opposed to daily events? Well, I, got this, I would say this. Uh, in newspapers, uh, not only do you have editorial pages that can differ from the news coverage, but you also have uh, op-ed columnists. Uh, to give other points of view. On television, particularly during a, during a war or some major event like that, um, they, uh, they, you have very little of that, uh, particularly in, in the case of the, of the Iraq War. Uh, almost all the commentators were generals, retired generals, uh, military uh, instructors, um, or um, you know, senators or whatever. There was very, very little of a dissenting view uh, during the build-up to the war, or, during, or while the war was going on, you almost never saw um, an opposing view on television. Now that was completely different in newspapers. Newspapers, you you always had some uh, columnist or somewhere someone was, or maybe just Dun a Dunsbury cartoon, but there was some commentary that often differed from the official view. Where on television, you tended to have the same talking heads, the same experts. All um, you know, uh, bolstering the uh, bolstering the war, um, and that's you know that's um, you know that's a that's a bad thing for television. On the other hand, you don't want to really imagine television with every, every reporter weighing in with their opinion. Um, you know, the problem with Fox News is that it's become so identified with the right that you you now have I don't know what the percentage is, but a very large percentage of the the public that only watches Fox News, and um, Everything else is seen as, as too liberal or anti-war or, or whatever. So you're, you were starting to go down this path, perhaps, where each of the networks will take on their own personality of, of political views. Um, so you might have uh, CNN will eventually be the liberal network, and MSNBC will be known as the, the centrist network, and people in those camps will only watch those networks. And um, now there's something to be said for that, as we've seen with Fox. Uh, with their identity, they're able to take the gloves off and, you know, be very strong for their position. Uh, and uh, it's certainly paying off in terms of viewers. And it does produce, if you're of that persuasion, it does produce some very convincing journalism, you know. It's, it's thrilling if you agree with them. Um, but it could end up where everything is so splintered that um, people are not talking to each other, uh, they're only they're all doing partisan journalism um, and I guess that's why I love newspapers is that I feel despite the claims of liberal bias and everything else uh, newspapers are generally full of dissenting views they're all over the map they, they seem to be really tough on one issue they're weak on another they seem to favor the Democrats here and the Republicans there uh, they're a mess <laughs> you know they're a healthy mess generally and I think that's what's great about newspapers, and uh, I hope I hope it stays that way, where they at least uh, strive for objectivity. You know, there's certainly a lot of questions about how objective anyone can be, but at least newspapers strive for objectivity, where television is going to reach the point where you know, that's not even on the on the map. All right. And uh, would you recommend? Uh, you know, what would you recommend to people who only receive their news from either ABC, CBS, or NBC? You mean um, watching right. television? one of those television shows, that half-hour show, if that's the only source of news. Uh, is there anybody <laughs> anymore? I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. yeah. So what would you what would you say? You know, just to generally. I mean, not. I mean, just imagine if you were talking to them. What kind of advice would you give? I would just advise people to uh, read more than one newspaper, uh, check out uh, internet sites. Uh, sometimes um, some of the best information comes from abroad, uh, certainly during the Iraq War. Uh, if, if you filter out the opinions and just go with what was being reported by the reporters, you had, in general, more accurate information coming out of the British papers, and, and, and uh, Britain was part of the coalition of the willing, so it's not like the, the Brits were against us, but uh, the British newspapers, or some of the British newspapers, were running articles that were uh, punching holes in the arguments for the war and were seen at the time as, you know, biased and wacko and everything else. But if you went to, on the internet, and went to a couple of British newspapers every day uh, during the build-up to the war and during the war after the war, you would have gotten a far truer sense of what was really going on than if you only read American newspapers. So, so sometimes letting in some of these outside views, while it may seem alien and uh, you're not quite sure who these writers are or who these publications are, sometimes can be a breath of fresh air. And you mentioned getting a, a breadth of reading more of than one newspaper. Can you speak to that and also kind of like the mosaic of trying to find the truth by reading many different sources? No, not really. Not more, any more than I've already said, I don't think. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, I've got to get, uh, okay. I've got so, to get going here. Okay. Um, I think that's good. <laughs>